Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to London Tech Leaders Series 5. Uh, appreciate you all joining us today. I know everyone's diary is pretty much uh, maxed out at the moment. Big thank you to our speakers uh, and everyone in attendance. Uh, a little bit about London Tech Leaders. So for people who haven't joined us before, uh, so we're a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing uh, platform exclusively for kind of CIOs, CTOs, uh, and people heading up engineering and digital functions. Um, so any questions around kind of the uh, the platform or the events, feel free to reach out to myself, uh, Chris, who's one of the uh, co-organizers and of course, David as well. So yeah, any questions or, 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 or whatever wanna get involved with future events, uh, just drop one of us a message and we'll come back straight to, come back to you straight away. Um, so yeah, I know obviously 2020 was the year for kind of QR codes. So, Get your cameras at the ready um so we are a social bunch you can follow us on the likes of linkedin twitter instagram uh so yeah feel free to to to, to follow us on that comment on anything you like or see uh, we really appreciate any feedback as well um so today's agenda it's going to be uh slightly shorter than our normal events due to the timing uh so we're going to do quick introductions now um the panel session will start shortly after and we should kind of wrap up about kind of 1 to 1.15. Uh, so we've got some great speakers today lined up, uh, some good topics from sustainability all the way down to kind of the ever evolving role of the CIO and CTO. Um, I'll let obviously our speakers do their own introductions, but you can see the high level there. Um, if you haven't done so already, please do think about uh, signing up to the London Tech Leaders newsletter. So this is this goes out monthly and we get anything from kind of like this will include things like thought leadership articles, video content, good mental health tips as well for yourself, uh, but also for your teams uh, from our good friends over at Sanctus. Uh, news from your industry and wider, uh, but also notifications on kind of upcoming events. Uh, so, yeah, have a think about signing up to that. Um, if you're ever thinking about perhaps getting involved with the London Tech Leaders uh, platform, there's plenty of opportunities to do so. So you can speak at an event like this. Uh, we've got the LCL show, which is the animated podcast, uh, which is available on Spotify and all major kind of platforms. You can become a contributing author with articles, blogs, etc. But I think that we're looking to launch quite soon is the LTL Bytes, which is, I suppose, short, sharp videos kind of on certain topics that you feel the community could value from. So this could be anything from kind of cybersecurity, uh, working from home, data-driven decision-making. Uh, so yeah, feel free to reach out if that's something that interests you. Um, obviously the event, one of our kind of key sponsors is WeShape. I'm actually one of the directors of that business as well. So a quick, I suppose, hello from us. So we're a DevOps digital and cloud native consultancy. Uh, we typically work with businesses on kind of uh, business and technical advisory project implementation, and we also do kind of training and coaching as well. So if you ever want to kind of uh, check out a little bit more about what we do, there's a website below, or feel free to drop me a line after the event. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, I'll pass over to David, uh, who can start uh, and facilitate the conversations. I'm the group CTO for Naked Wines. We're a direct to consumer uh, wine business across the globe. We service the UK, US and Australia. Um, I'm enjoying do that, but I've got a background in large corporates as well, the likes of Sky, BT, Camelot, stuff like that. Um, the idea being is that I'll be able to help our panelists here by facilitating an intelligent conversation. They'll provide the intelligence, I'll provide the facilitation. Um, uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask them to, to go around and because I've got a different view on my screen from everybody else, I'll just ask you to introduce yourself in, in, in the order that I call out your name. Azita, could we start with you, please? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, David, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Azita Smiley, I have been in technology for over two decades. Um, the first decade, my focus has been um, technology product development um, uh, at companies like um, Ericsson, um, Symbian, Betfair, Amazon. Um, and the last decade, the focus has been on digital transformation, uh, working both for organizations as well as consultancy firms such as EY and uh, Digital Catapult. I'm very excited to be here uh, with the fellow um, panelists today and looking forward to this conversation. Excellent. Thank you, Azita. Welcome. Uh, Richard. 
Great, hi, good to be here. So I'm Richard Davies. I'm the CEO of Alica Bank and a non-exec director at World Remit. So actually I'm, I'm kind of masquerading here because I'm not actually a, a CTO or, or CIO. But I, I, I sort of, I'm deeply interested in the topic and I think it's absolutely the heart of any um, any business these days and particularly financial services businesses. And I certainly do, do uh, I guess I'm an enthusiastic amateur, let's put it that way. Um, pr previous to this, I was the group COO for, for Revolut uh, and have kind of quite a bit of involvement in, in FinTech in the past. That's great. And, and we're a very inclusive bunch of technologists. So we're, we're happy to have you here, Richard. Uh, Vicky. Thanks, David. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to lovely to be here. I'm Vicky. I'm the CTO at Zego. Uh, we're a London based um, insurtech in the mobility space. Um, so we focus on um, commercial insurance um, right across from from gig economy riders right through to large fleets and uh, things like e-scooters. You know, if, if it moves and it's commercial, uh, we're interested in insuring it and changing the way that insurance operates and works in the world. Um, a bit about me, my, my career's mostly been based around software engineering. Um, I'm a back-end engineer by trade and I've moved into more team management and, and executive roles in the past few years. Um, particularly interested in the startup space, especially fast-growing businesses and how do you scale teams, how do you scale technology uh, to match the business ambitions and very excited about the topics today. Brilliant. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, Tony. Good afternoon. So I'm Tony Healy. I am Group CIO at a organisation called Mobica. So we are a software engineering and software solutions business. Um, aside from that, I'm a digital non-exec director, tech mentor and STEM ambassador. Um, my predominant focus is around digital transformation, security, change management and people development. Brilliant. Thank you, Tony. Sound like a busy boy. Uh, Maria. Yes, so I'm also not a CIO or CTO like Richard, um, but I invest in technology companies. So I'm a general partner at a fund called Kindred Capital here in London. And um, I started my career in corporate America at General Electric, very different world, but actually thought a lot about leadership and especially actually even in remote teams throughout the years there and realized that all the jobs I loved there were ambiguous and looked nothing like this much structured version of supply chain in large corporations. So I moved over to the startup world. So I spent some time working with startups abroad in India and Brazil, had a brief stint failingly co-founding something in Brazil, and then was in New York at a scaling ad tech startup um, before I moved over to venture. And I just love helping founders. I do that also on the side, work with a company that helps founders in Africa, um, and also start a, a nonprofit to help underrepresented founders access venture. So definitely passionate about all things venture capital and investing in the, you know, the next generation of great technologists and, and great founders. That's brilliant. Thank you, Maria. So you can see uh, we've got a, a, a wide array of skills and expertise and experience here. Uh, should make for a, a lively discussion. Um, and just a, a shout out to all, all of those in the audience. Don't forget that we've got our questions and answer uh, session uh, where you can post up a, a question. Um, uh, we'll be looking at those as we go through. And if it's appropriate, I'll, I'll pluck out individual questions and, and uh, see if we can get, get, get our panelists to, to give a view on them as well. So don't be shy, please, audience. All right, on to the first question. Um, so we're going to talk about sustainability in digitalization. Um, so, you know, I think uh, a few years ago, a lot of people were like, right, well, I'm, I'm going to put all of my data centers into a green data center. I'm, I'm done now, right? I'm sustainably dig digital wise. Uh, probably not enough, really. And given that the, there's a lot of focus around the world now on global climate change and, and associated sustainability, it feels like we probably need to do a little bit more in the digital world. Um, but but that can have some positives and some negatives. So how, how do we balance sustainability in, in a new digital era? That's our question. Um, Azita, I'm going to come to you first. And what do you feel are the positives and the negatives here? And how can we balance those? Thank you, David. Um, so uh, the sustainability and digitization have been two mega trends uh, that have been hyped up in the last uh, decade. However, the flavor of the hype and, and the drivers have been very different. Digitization has been focused on technology innovation, digital economy, uh, while the sustainability has been from moral perspective or regulatory uh, aspects. Um, and I believe that there's an opportunity lost because uh, to really drive innovation, having that inclusivity of uh, business nature and uh, society 
uh, when uh, a driving digitalization is very important. Uh, the uh, digitalization so far, unfortunately, as you mentioned, hasn't really uh, impacted sustainability positively. Um, even move to the cloud, um, if the data center or the, the cloud provider is not using green energy, and because of the share uh, growth of use of the uh, usage of the cloud, the carbon footprint will be very high. Um, and also, if you look at device manufacturers, it's the same. Um, the business model is around uh, building new uh, and uh, the uh, footprint for um, recycling and reusage of old pieces is very small. So, uh, and as you see, th these topics are, both topics are very complex, layered, uh, but for the benefit of the audience and uh, uh, this session, I think there are opportunities for technology leaders um, to actually uh, impact uh, their organizations and drive uh, um, innovation and economic, uh, su sustainable economic growth um, through um, their work in, in digitalization. Uh, one is, we talked about cloud uh, briefly, so all three major providers at the moment are public cloud, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft and Amazon are moving their major data centers uh, to zero carbon. So even though the uh, energy consumption is very high. The level of efficiency that they provide comparing to on-premise uh, cloud and so on is uh, much higher, uh, as well as their uh, carbon footprint is very small because they uh, start using uh, green energy. Um, second is around devices. And um, again, um, as a technology leader, there's an opportunity to drive, bring your own device and um, reusage of devices rather than uh, promoting a new uh, parts more and more. Um, third is around suppliers. Really majority of application products that is used in, in technology, you have suppliers uh, that you can impact through choosing the ones that are moving to green, use green energy or have um, the uh, sustainable approach to uh, product development. And last but not least uh, is product development in general. Um, so far we have been used to lean product development, which is really remove of waste. Uh, but the next generation product development can uh, is click. Uh, and it stands for uh, circular. So all parts of that product can be reused um, and uh, um, recycled. A lean, which again focuses on uh, efficiency. Uh, inclusive, it actually thinks about, think about nature, society, and economics rather than just economics. Uh, and last but not least is clean. So click. Uh, CLIC uh, is the next generation product development approach, uh, which will drive enormous amount of innovation in product development and uh, sustainable economic growth. That, that, there's some fabulous insights, and I, I hadn't heard of Click. I have to say, I just wrote down wrote down that I, I can feel myself using that going forward. I mean, really interesting that you right at the top there called out the the moral and business aspect to it. Yeah. And I think I think until we get a combination of those two together, we, we won't see real investment and progress in this area. Um, you talked about footprints. Uh, we traditionally say carbon footprint, but, but there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, Clive in, in the audience has said, are we also thinking about sustainability in terms of remote working and community footprints, for example? Um, and, and, you know, that's naturally something that's, that's at the forefront of our mind. But Maria, I wanted to come to you, 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 you know, um, uh, Azita and, and myself and some of the others have worked in large corporations that are now having to retrofit, you know, uh, a, a more sustainable world. But you, you work from the ground up with lots of organizations, new businesses and stuff like that. How are they tackling sustainability? Are they getting in on day one on that? Yeah, I mean, this is something that is a great question because getting in on day one is just, that's where you can shape it more, right? It's much harder to retrofit. And so we're taking that very seriously. And I have found it's one thing I recently moved from the US to Europe and 
founders here, I think are much more receptive and it's already top of mind, right? I think there are certain brands in the US, but I feel like founders here really care. We, for example, have um, an ESG program where as soon as we invest in a company and we invest very early. So this is like person and an idea and maybe like a drawing. There's like rarely anything built out beyond that. Um, we sit down with them and look at a whole framework, which we call this universe, you know, the universe of responsible actions. And we take a pretty wide view to ESG here, but we think about like basically go through what their company is because it really depends on if it's a hardware company versus a software company and exactly what they're doing. But we think through what are the actions they can take and how can they set it up from day one. And the categories that we look within that framework are around employees. So from a diversity and inclusion perspective, from a health and safety, people, policies, even remote work, that's where that would fall for us. We look at the environment, we look at community engagement, we look at governance, and we also look at responsible product design. So I think even data biases and things like that come out. And so we look at kind of the universe of what you could do and how you could design ESGN from day one. And then usually founders tend to pick a few things that are really important and given what, you know, what they want to offset um, or what they're trying to drive as a change. Um, but we find that having the conversations very, very early with founders um, and the senior teams to also help execute it changes it. It's almost like hiring for diverse teams. Like if you, if you wait until you're hundred people, good luck getting your ESG initiatives off the ground. And so we try and start them really early, but you know, it is a, it is a more new topic that I think people have been interested in recently in the last year or two. Okay. That's great. Uh, you, uni universe of responsible actions. I'm getting some great little sayings here. This, I, I really like that one. I think one of the interesting areas there that, you know, you make a point about whether you're in the software world or the hardware world. And of course, those two often cross together. You know, recently I've been more involved in the software world. So I'm thinking data centers, I'm thinking, you know, suppliers as Azita was saying, and how do I work with those? But actually the hardware world, you know, I, I, I was at one time working in the mobile devices world and you know, how they get manufactured, the components that are in them and all that kind of stuff. That that's yeah. all sustainable. And and now I'm working less technical, but you know, in the wine world we have bottling and distribution and all those kind of things. And there's a, there's a role for it all to play there. So actually um, on that front, you know, we, we see a lot of that on the hardware side is like, how do you make the supply chain sustainable? Um, uh -huh. But then we're also seeing it as a category of its own to invest in, which I probably should also say is like, we're looking at companies that are trying to, you know, have an impact on society and trying to make it a, you know, a better world in that way. Like we just looked at a company called Clean Hub, which is essentially offsetting your plastic footprint, not your carbon footprint. Um, and so they work with brands that have direct to consumer brands, and then they offset it with a series of different recycling partners in, in different countries, but they've gone really deep in actually creating, they have a whole way to create non-recyclable materials into recyclable materials. And so I think that there are, it's a category even for investment right now, separate from what each company is doing. Cool. Okay. And the, the click approach that I mentioned, CS stands for circular, and it means that every single piece that is used in a hardware, everything from washing machine to, to train, um it can be recycled or reused again in another product uh, so that's the uh, uh, approach in in click that you don't do any waste you don't create any waste sure sure okay all right listen that was a good one thank you very much some some uh, some really interesting thoughts there i've certainly learned some stuff um let's move on to our next question so uh, managing inter-team relationships in a remote world. So it was going to come up. We're all working remotely. We're all fed up of it. We want to go to the pub. But um, we've still got our teams. Um, we've had people join uh, uh, whilst we've been working from home. We've had people leave whilst we've been working from home. We've had different teams focus on different things. And part of our roles as leaders is to always make sure that the uh, those teams are building trust-based relationship and, and able to work together. Um, the introduction of remote working has had to have an impact on this and, and makes it more challenging. What, are, what have you guys found challenging in, in this regard? And, and what sort of tips and techniques might you have for, for adapting your leadership style and getting teams working better together during re remote working? Vic, Vicky, have you got any thoughts on this? Um, yes, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a huge piece that obviously affects all of us um, um, a lot at the moment, the world changed under our feet um, incredibly quickly in most in most businesses I, I think the building trust piece that you mentioned there David is absolutely the crux of the issue how do you enable teams to maintain that level of understanding of trust knowledge of the individuals I mean trust is knowing you know expecting that you know how somebody's going to approach something or react to something and for me that's all about communication and I think we all know it was you know before this world we all used to talk about you know 
email is a terrible or a terrible way of communicating slack is a terrible way of communicating you know written communication and i think zoom has you know it's not quite at that end of the spectrum but i think it does remove so much of the context when you're not sat next to each other physically in an office and i think that's the thing that you need to compensate for um, when you're managing your teams when you're putting the ways of working in place when you're putting the structures in place and i think one of the things that we found um, we're very lucky um, in engineering as ego to have a fantastic team of engineering managers and I think you know their impact on checking in with people being explicit about things um, and weeding out those problems early you know if there is mistrust you know developing between teams being explicit about it um, addressing it early setting up the conversations because you know, whether we like it or not, we're all missing that, you know, tacit learning that we get from, from watching how teams interact in a room, from seeing people go off to a meeting with each other, seeing teams working. We, we, don't, we don't see any of that anymore. And I, I suppose for me as a leader, one of the main um, concerns I have is for junior employees who might be in, you know, one of their first roles there's so much learning goes on in the team about you know what does what does that team over there do you know I, I don't necessarily have a reason to work with them or to go to their meetings or but you know I'm in the office and I can see what they do I can see they go off and have their team meeting that I can see what they're writing on the whiteboard and that amount of learning I think has to be explicitly compensated for in this remote world I think the remote working opportunity gives us you know incredible opportunities in some spaces you know distributed hiring and the ability for the flexibility piece for diversity inclusion and belonging as well like there are some real upsides that we can use this um, situation for um, but I would say we need to be very very careful about making sure that people are aware of who everybody else is how they work what they're doing and making sure we've got those trust points one of the practical things we've done um, is just to introduce check-ins at the top of meetings 10 minutes how is everybody? What does the world look like to you at the moment? Before we delve into the transactional nature of whatever meeting or one-to-one -one it might be, how are people doing? What does the world look like to you at the moment? Because I won't have seen it. And I think that's quite a powerful tool to deploy. No, I, th I, th I, think, that, I think that's spot on. The tacit learning bit that you, you talk about is something that is just so overlooked. And I think we're going to find a deficit in that over the next couple of years. Because, you know, we just run a survey across our company and, and huge numbers of people came back and said, yeah, no, we're OK working at home. Thanks very much. Right. And, and you know, they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And they're going to miss out on some of the more junior employees. T Tony, you, you've got quite a distributed organization already, right? You, you, you're used to working in a in a very distributed way for multiple customers all over the place. It, you know, you, you must have cracked some of this in the past before, haven't you? Uh, we haven't got all the answers because I think everyone is still learning. Um, you know, it's fine. You need to find a balance because when is too much video too much and when is too little too little? You know, it's not every meeting should be a video call. Not every, you know, back to back Zoom meetings, Teams meetings, whatever they are, um, are draining on people. So it's finding a fine balance. Um, they are important because they overtake um traditional conference calls because you can still engage in a little bit of body language even though you're only in a little square box you know you can still read into how people are what some of those reactions are um and sometimes it's the you know the things that are unsaid that you pick up on so i think that's where video can come into its own um you know as we progress you know through you know this year and into next year i think the solutions that we're using will get better for collaborative working you know, we will move away from just, you know, 49 little boxes on a screen that you talk to people to much more inclusive and interactive platforms, which are out there at the moment. Um, you know, there's a lot of good systems for um, all hands meetings. You know, there's a lot of good systems there for, um, you know, breakout sessions and things. And they're absolutely critical. You know, we as leaders, we need to balance looking at you know how much communication we give to our you know our teams but i think as vicky said it's what else happens around the business so you know as a technology team we can get everyone on a on a zoom call or a teams call or, or wherever it may be but we're not necessarily including other functions so it's important that we have something set up within businesses that makes people feel part of a wider company not just a, a wider team um, and then the whole onboarding process of new people, you know, coming on board, how can we make them more inclusive? You know, not just 
getting a box in the post with your laptop and you know a screen or a docking station is great but what's the process how can i feel engaged i think as offices open up more you know we're never going to lose the office but the office is going to be much more collaborative it's going to be much more of a location you go for for that social interaction and meaningful discussions yeah, I think that's so spot on. And I, I would say to both of the points, like it's it's not even about like the, there's also a piece of it, not tacit learning, but tacit relationships, right? Like when you make a tea with someone, you just learn a little bit more about them. Like, oh, what did you do over the weekend? And I think you need some setup for the all hands, but you also need some way to get that personal relationship. So it's not just a transactional relationship. Um, yeah. I actually managed a remote team when we didn't have a travel budget and we were moving a team from India to China. Um, but I think that we actually set up conversations around like, who are you as a human? Like, what were the jobs you had before this? And like, what do you do outside of work? And what brings you energy? And like, what are the ways you like to work? Would you rather do audio or get a message? And I think that a lot of our startups are starting to do things like this, or even like giving people virtual coffees, but like finding ways to connect with each other one-on-one that are not just about a work, a work the deliverable to, to be done. And I think there's- I think, I think that's it. That's work. absolutely one of the key points. You know, we've got a, a fantastic, you know, HR lady. Uh, and on some of our um, t- like groups for different offices, you know, they've got cooking competitions that go on. They've got, you know, sports competitions, quizzes, all these types of things which engage people. Because if this is, you know, the platform in the world that we're working in, it can't just be about work. There has to be some social interaction there, as there was in the office, you know, when people used to go out for coffee at lunchtime or, you know, go grab a lunch together. There needs to be that sort of element as well. Um, so I think that's really important, the way we engage them from a, a non-work perspective as well. Um, and just my last thing on this as well, education of managers and leaders has to be key because this is new for them. You know, I, I know people who have never managed remote teams before who are just used to managing people in an office. Yeah. Well, doing it remotely is very, very different. It's a very different skill set. I think as, as corporates and organisations, we need to ensure we invest in that training for our leaders in order to look after their teams um, because it's brand new to them. And conversely to that, Tony, I, for example, have managed lots of remote teams over the past 20 years. So I'm like, this is no big deal. I can do it. It's fine. But recognizing that none of my current teams have ever worked in that way. So I've got it's no good me going, yeah, I've got this. I've got to think how they're feeling. So getting our empathy shoes on with our team is is pretty important as a a leader there. Yeah. And people will get it wrong, but we just need to educate and learn from the mistakes. Exactly. Richard, as a CEO, uh, you know, in a, in a technology driven industry, you're always looking for the, the right talent. What, one of our panelists, uh, one of our um, audience, Nicholas, has said, how are we addressing in the current world context things like career transformation? Right. So you obviously need everybody in your organization to be at the top of your game. But is there opportunity here for um, I've, I've suddenly got ballet dancers con- converting to security people in the in my mind but is there an opportunity here for us in this remote world to help people with that te- technology you know that career transformation yeah i, I think there is i mean I, I do agree with the point that was made earlier around I, I think learning when you're starting from scratch is is harder in this remote environment i, I think that's definitely a harder thing but uh, I, I don't think there's been a change though in particular a faster growing company or a large company i, I think both those situations create a fast growing company naturally creates opportunity for people to progress and change roles um, as they, if they prove themselves um, to be sort of flexible and adaptable, which is often some of the key, key skill sets for a fast growth company. But, but also a large company, I mean, I guess there you have to go out of your way to make it happen more. But clearly, if you've got, I mean, I used to work at HPC, they had 250,000 people. Um, the ability there to um, create uh, rotational schemes which, which actually they're very good at where people could move between disciplines between countries and, and really broaden their learning was was, was very high so I, I think um yeah it, it's it's just one where i think that learning skills from scratch is just well technical skills probably easier to a degree because yeah uh, course error or, there's lots of good things out there that help you learn the sort of um, the theory, I guess, is, is applied versions of that, 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 and particularly how it's done in, in your company that can can be harder. And then softer skills, I, I think, is is very hard to teach remotely. So, that's something where I, I guess the, the sort of the flexible model we we're talking about earlier, that the, the degree of being in the office at least some of the time to help drive that um, softer skills and learning around that is is definitely key. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and and I think I don't think we've seen 
the completion of this yet because as we starting to maybe get back to some office working I think we're going to spend another year 18 months working out what that balance looks like and how to set up the physical office you know dealing with people working in teams when half the team is remote and half the team is in the office so it, it even though we've been in this situation for a year and we've all taken to zoom like ducks to water I think it's going to go again I think it's going to all change it again over the next year 18 months and that's going to be a little bit of a, a mind-boggling thing okay should we move on uh good chat on that thanks for the audience participation there um yeah regulation favorite subject of, of many we've got a couple of people on the panel who, who work in highly regulated areas uh, we've got finance gaming insurance all of those areas i've worked in some pretty regulated areas as well a lot, lot of conversation on there uh, out in, uh, at the moment about tech first companies you know the, the the facebook's and the amazons of this world and heavily regulating them in different areas you know are, are we getting this right in our in our industry are, are we getting the balance of regulations right uh, should we be suppressing technology does it does it crush innovation don't know sticking with you Richard you know you're in a highly regulated industry in, in the banking world what, what's what's your feeling about regulation and how it, how we need to balance it out yeah I, I guess my first point would be I'm not sure is tech itself is not really a, an industry is my view it's a skill set um, I mean most tech companies are working in a industry that ha often had a traditional uh, element to it so I, I know, Amazon clearly retailing or um, or uh, on-premise data centers, I guess, if you want to go that way as well. Um, delivery, uh, your, your local restaurants for takeaway. So, I mean, I think generally the regulation is going to be often shaped by what the incumbent sector looked like, uh, it's fair to say. I, I, I know in financial services, there's, there's lots of regulation, and I mean, having worked at Revolut, that was very very tech first company but for sure had to comply with regulations in in the us and singapore and australia and lithuania and romania and uh, all around the world and you've got to be able to um, apply both and i think the ability for companies and in highly regulated industries to to get that into their dna is, is almost code as opposed to paper based processes for compliance is is, is really important but the more general point i'd make here though is one of um I think that the thing that irks me with the some of the big tech and why I think there is a need for regulation, uh, and GDPR has gone a little away here, but I, 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 I personally kind of, for me, data is the customers. And a lot of companies build their, mo their, their model around monetizing customer data. That, in my view, is just not theirs and is not generally passportable. So as part of the introduction of um, open banking, in the UK, which was about making uh, bank transactional data portable, which historically was a um, incumbent barrier, right, that got, got used to block competition. So I personally would say regulate, forcing open data across in all industries is generally a very good thing in my view. And yes, that'll force a lot of change business model, but I, I think that is, those business models are bad if they rely on exploiting private customer data. Okay, all right. Azita, what, what, what do you think about that? Um, so I'm seeing that from a different perspective. Um, we have, when it comes to, uh, uh, completely agree with Richard that technology is not a, biz, is not a uh, kind of company or, or business. It is actually as enabler. Um, enabler to deliver food, enable to share information and so on. And the um, digital native organizations, uh, Gatham Group and Alibaba's and so on, uh, we see the economic growth that they have had is being based on using data and, and uh, personal data and uh, is their practices uh, that has been known to us in the last few years through whistleblowing activities rather than a transparency from, from them. So if any regulation is in there, um, and and uh, an example is the uh, um, Cambridge Analytica uh, and the effect that it had on uh, um, uh, democracy, democratic uh, process of election, for instance. Um, so, and regulatory space, regulatory, regulatory bodies are um, struggling. Normally, they are behind the digital innovation and technology innovation. Um, and they can 
regulate something that they understand. Um, and the, the nature of these businesses has been very shape shifting uh, going from uh, connecting students at the um, campus uh, to being the largest information sharing platform uh, around the globe. Um, so I believe that the uh, um, uh, incremental regulation and incremental changes uh, will help rather than sit and wait to be able to define what these platforms are. Are they utilities uh, like electricity that anybody can use, um, or um, they are some? What is the nature of them? And in the market, I've seen um, the most recent and uh, best approach has been in. Australia, Australian government has uh, imposed uh, on uh, these platforms um, a regulation around publishing news and charging them for, for doing that. Um, the reason for that is really the pressure from the business and from the news corporations. Uh, however, there is no champion, there hasn't been any champion about public data because these companies have been building empires on back of personal data through selling ads and so on. So one uh, approach, good approach, would be that taking the Australian model, but going a step forward further, we focus on uh, usage of personal data. So as our data being used and ads being sold to us, how about enabling a mechanism that every time my data is used, a kickback from that revenue uh, is uh, coming back to me as an individual. Um, and that will create a um, more careful um, approach to their practices in terms of how they use uh, personal data and citizen data. And also create a, um, can create a, a negative source of income uh, for every single citizen uh, that the data being used um, uh, for an uh, economic growth of these businesses. I think that's, I, I, I mean, it's quite revolutionary to sort of say, right, well, we're going to use all your data and we're going to give you a kickback for it. But I quite like the idea. And I think there is a lot of people out there who'll be like, yeah, fine, I'm, I'm up for that. I mean, there'll probably a little micro industry will be created out of it. And a bit like when eBay first came along, people will start running businesses saying, I just sell my opinions all the time. Um, so that, 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 that's interesting. Um, uh, Maria, from a, where, is, where is regulation a, a good thing? Where does it foster opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think to your point earlier, it's about the balance. It's like what type of regulation can be helpful. I think as Richard mentioned, open banking in Europe has actually enabled a lot of innovation. I think one thing we've seen in the US is that, you know, some of the regulation is, makes it difficult to make certain innovations in the financial sector. Um, and there's certain sectors like, you know, I've invested in crypto and Bitcoin companies. And a lot of those founders have told me over the years that like having an absence of regulation is actually much worse than having no regulation because you don't even know where the lines are. You can't, you don't know where to color. Um, and so if you have constraints, you can figure out how to build it around that. But if you don't even know what they are, it's, um, and it, it is real, right? I mean, in the run up in 2017, people were wondering if they would go to jail if they did an ICO. Like, it, you know, there's real personal and technology implications if you don't have in the absence of regulation in general. And I think to Azita's point, it's also just about getting people informed, right? There needs to be a lot more channels between who's building and the regulators because it often feels like they're a bit behind, right? I think a lot of people probably followed like the Facebook capital conversations and just felt like the questions that were being asked were very, very basic. And I think that, you know, but there's other great examples where regulators really are on top of it. And it's also, it's not even about balance for industry. It's also about balance for size of company. Like one of the, the DA, there's an organization in New York that regulates financial services and they put out this edict that everyone has to have a security officer. So aside from the CTO, you have to have a CISO that can't be the same person. And that affects a large bank very differently than it affects a 12 person company. And so I think it's also important to think about like what regulation is appropriate for all different size companies. Yeah, I, I agree with probably. that. And I think, um, you know, one of the key things is that regulatory bodies need to be working more with the businesses because the regulation can't keep up with the speed of change of technology. Um, and that's where you get, you know, legislation or, or regulatory guidance and governance coming out, which then appears to be 12 months out of date because technology has, has moved on so fast and the data has moved on so fast and everything around it. Um, they just can't keep up with the pace. So I think a lot more communication with different size or different tiers of organization is key because you're absolutely right. Not every organization can afford 
you know, a CISO and then, you know, a data protection officer and then a CIO or a CTO or whatever it may be. So I think those communication channels are absolutely critical. And, and I think that's sort of part of the point that, that Zeta was making, yeah, about, about the regulators can't keep up. So what happens, in my experience, I, I, you know, we sell alcohol, we work in a highly regulated world and, and we've got GDPR in, in the UK and Europe, we've got the Australian Privacy Act, and then in, you know, the, the most substantial one is America is CCPA in California, but then all the other states have a, a variant as well, right? Yeah. It's really difficult to keep up with. And we find that, therefore, we get this broad brush mandate come down to us. And it's and it's just totally off whack. It's unnecessary. So if we were more engaged and being proactive and maybe, dare I say, it, offering up what reasonable regulation looks like, then that might make that path easier, as you're saying, Tony. Absolutely. And that otherwise it becomes open to interpretation. And then no one ever gets anything right because your view is different from somebody else's view. And then that's where, you know, you get a lot of debate, especially, you know, around what was DPA and things like that. Philip, Philip Wiggs chipped in with a question here. Thank you, Philip, saying linking this question to the last one, which is very clever. You should be a panelist leader. Uh, Bitcoin has a carbon footprint comparable to that of New Zealand. Is there regulation needed there? Anybody got any views on that? Um, I will find a link in a second and put it in the chat to everyone. Um, I mean, I, it's a huge, huge concern. Um, so I, I am worried about it. And I, I think there is, there needs to be thoughtful, thoughtfulness around that. Um, there is also someone I know who has a contrarian view. To be fair, I am not, I don't know what the view is yet. So I'm not really backing it, but um, you should follow her because she has an interesting case for why she thinks it's actually not affecting climate change as much as other people think it is. But um, from my perspective so far, I do think that the mining and the, the compute power is just insane. And so um, there needs to be thoughtfulness around how to move forward with that for sure. Yeah, okay, all right. Good, okay, lively debate on that one, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to, our, on to our final question. We've got some time so, so we, can, uh, we can delve into this a little bit. It's, uh, it's general and, and uh, I don't mind a bit of lightheartedness in your responses here. The role of the CIO CTO. Now it's interesting because in in uh, Maria and Richard in particular, we, we don't necessarily have technologists here, but it'd be interesting to see what they look for in their CIO and CTOs. Uh, as Ita, Tony, Vicky, and I might want to take some notes. Um, but uh, I think that that um, you know it, it's changed over the last five years, certainly, right? And I think also there's a we often say CIO, CTO in the same breath, and it used to be one was inward facing, one was outward facing. It feels more complicated than that now. There's there's more nuance to it than that. So it'd be interesting to hear people's views on that. But but given how much it's changed in the last five years, given the pace of technology, and then things like coronavirus just throwing us all a, a curveball, yeah? What, as technology leaders, or, or, or for others, what should, would you look for in your technology leaders? How do we need to prepare for that ever-changing job specification? Vicky, you got, I'm going to come to all of you on this because because I think we'll all have a view. But Vicky, let's start with you. Um, it's a huge, huge question. Um, so I'm going to sort of try and try and sort of bound myself to one piece um, that I see a trend in at the moment, and I think it's it's a push for accountability. I think it's definitely a changing nature of the role that I've seen. I, I think with as you say, technological advances have pushed us away from, you know, being behind the scenes, keeping things running, you know, engineering itself isn't as low level as it used to be. There are services that, you know, the sort of, you know, push for, for cloud services, everything that sort of goes with that does push engineering to a different space for me. You know, you're far more focused on the product. The engineers in the room do have a different mindset. And then as a, as a technology leader, you become far more exposed to the business concerns, the commercial aspect of the business. And then as such, I think as leaders of companies, you know, we, we talked about regulation, we talked about the impact that technology can have in real world events. Um, the handling of people's personal data, the impact of the spread of communication of information. And I think as leaders, we are being pushed more to the forefront to be accountable for the impact of technology in the world, in companies, on commercial targets. And for me, that is where the role is, I've noticed it, become far more prevalent in, in that arena um, than I've seen it being in the past. So for me, I think this is all about you know, being able to account for the work your team's doing and be take that sort of moral and commercial stance um, in the way you set up your teams and the way that you push work through them. So that'd be one pillar that I would, I'll contribute. I think accountability is key. I certainly feel that 
more and more. I, I you know, and, and I think it's a good thing, uh, partly what, what Richard and Azita were saying earlier on about, you know, technology is not the business. It's, it's an enabler for the businesses. I, I find myself, and I'm sure you guys do, being more part of the business and, and less part of the actual doing of technology. And I think, you know, therefore, I'm, I'm not just accountable for the technology, but I'm accountable for the business being successful as a result of the technology we provide, right? And that becomes a, a, a little bit of a little, I mean, it's what we've all asked for for years and now it's happening and we're like, oh, oh you know. So. Exactly. Uh, Richard, what, what are you looking for in a CIO, CTO of the future? Oh, good question. So I'm actually hiring for a CTO right now. So <laughs> any, any, uh, anyone in the audience uh, fancy applying, feel free. Um, but uh, so, I mean, for me, it does depend quite a lot on how the business organizes and how it thinks and so on. Uh, I mean, I, I took over a CEO last summer and uh, I guess I'm a massive fan of the sort of model that more digitally native organizations use like a, like a Revolut where you, I mean, I guess it's often misused but called the Spotify model of um, where you're really trying to embed uh, engineering right at the heart of uh, the business as opposed to having a very siloed uh, functional structure that would have more, more traditionally been the case. So uh, having essentially uh, customer service aligned, be it internal or external customer service aligned squads that have product owner, designer, front end, back end data, whatever's kind of needed to get, to get the job done. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's quite a massive shift there. C certainly within banking, the, the classic role of the CIO was it, you're often really stapling together a bunch of third party uh, rather than building in house. Um, and it was often, as I say, kind of quite a separate function to the business. So for me, there's that, um, that, that sort of desire to want to work in that way and work therefore very closely with the, the CPO, the COO. Um, and then I think within that then sort of for me, the the CTO is almost like the, the overall enterprise architect, the, the person that really makes sure the thing whole, comes together across the across those squads is is quite imperative. I, I saw Vladi Senko do that at, at Revolut I mean, unbelievably well with kind of 55 or whatever it was squads running in parallel um, and, and somehow keep the whole thing <laughs> having some sense of alignment and, 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 uh, and coherency. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a really, really well, I think it's a critical role and, and, and uh, has massively changed in the last uh, few years from what I've seen. And I think the point about CIO CTO split is is an important one. Um, I mean, I would say in my organisation, I'm doing both at the moment, and, and and therefore am I doing both well? Don't don't know. I'll leave others to judge that. But uh, I, I think that you know we we should look at you know a CIO perhaps not worrying too much about the technology and maybe some of the issues that we've talked about previously about growth. You know, I, I, I may be looking to tackle some of the team and remote working stuff that we were talking about earlier. And therefore, you might have an opportunity where a CTO could report to a CIO and they're more of an architect rather than the other way around. D does it matter if, you you know, are they both board level roles or, or should they be sort of one role reports to another? Anybody got any views on that? None whatsoever, because you don't want to give up their roles. <laughs> um. I'll, I'll, I'll chip in on this conversation, uh, if you don't mind. So, you know, I think what you were saying is right. You know, I stopped being a, the, the senior technologist in, in companies years and years ago. And, it, you know, I've got you know, teams of people who are much better at the tech than I am. You know, my role now is more about relationship management, change management, you know, business management, understanding contracts, understanding third party relationships, the legal aspects, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, CTOs have developed over the years from being, you know, purely focused on engineering to now being able to actually go out and hold conversations with customers and, you know, lead teams and things like that. And I think that they, they've naturally progressed, you know, from being a senior dev to being, you know, much more, a, I'm a business owner, I have business accountability and responsibility. Um, CIO is the same, you know, but I think, you know, IT and technology have you know always had this fight to be part of this top table within you know businesses, and they want to have a presence and a voice. But I think we're we're going towards a world now, and I've just jotted some down here where you you know a business could have a CIO, a CTO, a CDIO, a CTIO, a CITO, a Chief Digital Officer, a Chief Data Officer, a Chief Product Officer. There's there's more C level job titles now in technology than there's ever been. Um, and I think it's it's down to us as leaders to to re 
refocus that on what that organization needs. And it's down to businesses as well to work with us to say, I need to focus on digital transformation or products or whatever it may be. But we're going to get to a stage where, you know, where we used to be fine for a chair, you know, in the boardroom. Now there's not going to be enough chairs for us because there's that many different sea levels that are in there. So I think roles are being refocused around being much more around leadership and development and people management and then having very good deputies who cover products who cover you know architecture who cover security who cover design etc um so i think it will continue to evolve um i'm just mindful that it may evolve into yet more different job titles because we're struggling to try and work out what areas of accountability and responsibility people should have Go, 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 I think it's, I mean, this is really, I mean, this is where the CEO needs to kind of earn their, their crust really, don't they? Because I, I mean, I've totally seen the proliferation of like, it's sort of what, what C-suite job can we create this week type yeah. uh, approach, particularly in large companies. I, I've definitely seen that. Um, I mean, for me, I, I guess it's sort of the wrong way of thinking about it. I, I, I think that, so I always talk about banks uh, and, and fintechs really, uh, I mean, as they're two things they're people and their data there was literally nothing else i mean we don't make fridges or toys or wine we have no branches um so there's nothing apart from those two things um so and if you've got a whole management team that thinks they're, they're nothing to do with data it's just the cio's job or the cto's job or well let's go and bring in a cdo because we kind of need someone it, it's just completely wrong uh way of thinking about it, it, it it's sort of you got to everyone should care about these things but clearly there'll be some people that are very specialized in it but yeah i, I think proliferation of job titles is completely the wrong way to approach the problem absolutely and and thank you for that both um working in transformation in the last 10 years it has been that we have the cio that manages the back back end normally infrastructure and and so on the cto that manages the product portfolio oh we have we have a lot of data what should we do we throw in a CDO in there as well. And then if you're in a regulatory space, you have a CISO, then you have a head of innovation and, uh, you know, and all of them really managing the same thing, which is the technology stack and the product portfolio. So as the dig digitalization progresses, majority of the CIO functions are being managed by machines. One thing or not, the end game of enterprise uh, digitalization is really um, everything being managed software as service, by cloud, by augmented intelligence. Um, and the, when it comes to the product stack and data and so on, so the role of CIO moves from uh, managing infrastructure, you're really understanding the business need and building applications that are enabling business to do their work. Um, and the same way, I think that we have seen that um, developers, we have front-end, back-end developer, testers, so on, and now we have full-stack uh, software development uh, engineers that do everything. I believe all these roles will also merge. And as Richard said, the focus will be on talent management and uh, data insight and how to manage and utilize and secure that data to enable the business. Sure. Uh, Maria, so we, we've talked about lots of lots of roles there, talent management, and whether they're, you know, a senior role having lots of people underneath them. But, but in, in some of the smaller companies that you look to invest in, you know, you don't necessarily want to spend all your money on a whole load of senior roles, right? So is the, is the day of the all-rounder, the general good all-rounder who can come in and do wear all of those hats? Is, is that what you're looking for in a CIO, CTO or not? I would say it really depends on the company. It absolutely depends on the company, right? If you're building in financial services infrastructure, you better have built in financial services infrastructure before. There's other companies where, you know, we would back a first-time CTO who's been working for three years. Like it really depends on the company, but I would say it's almost unheard of that we would back someone without a good technical co-founder or without the need to bring one on very quickly. Um, I think that that person needs to be the type of technical co-founder that can get something off the ground, but then they usually take one of those two paths, right? As Tony and Azita highlighted, they usually either want to be the engineering manager and really 
grow the organization or they want to be the sort of architects, CTO, I guess, traditional like data, all of that. Um, and, and I think that neither one is right or wrong, but you usually, as the organization grows, you're going to want both. I think at the beginning, it's more important um, to have a technical co-founder that knows the space and also is the type of person, like it's not for everyone to work in a two person company and grow it from like the zero to one, which is like kind of zero people in my head to like 30 and like seed or A round. That is a very particular type of chaos that you either like or you hate. And then, you know, 30 to hundred is another. And so there's different technical people that you need at each of those stages. You need engineers right away, usually, um, which is always hard to find. The one thing I would add from a big company perspective, because we deal, we actually sell into, you know, our companies sell into a lot of CTOs and things like that. And I think I would just put it on all of your radars for those of you that are out there at bigger companies is there's a dynamic that I'm really interested in as an investor that might affect you differently as a manager. So um, we've seen this trend where it used to be that everyone sold to the CTOs. And now we're seeing where like it's developer first change. So you're seeing all these movements where basically developers can just put the code in and you essentially you've, used a product. You haven't signed an MSA, you haven't negotiated anything, hasn't gone through your procurement. And I'm actually personally interested in that in some ways because there's some interesting movements where it really makes sense to have developer first or even open sourced types of code, but there's kind of all these hybrids now. And I feel like as a manager, you might just want to be a little bit more on top of that because, you know, before you know it, you could have a lot of things going on with your code base um, or a lot of vendors that you might be using that you might not even be aware of. So I, I would put that on people's radar as something to uh, so ever, ever add thing to, uh, not to add another thing to your list of ever changing roles, as we just said, but. No, but it's a, it's a really good point and, and one we need to get on the front foot with because, uh, you know, we, we immediately go to, oh, let's close stuff down, but then we're all worried we're going to stifle innovation at the same time, right? So how do you balance that out? Yeah, I, I think having, I think actually for, for me, one of the things, I'm not a control freak, but I like to know what's going on, right? Sort of thing. And I like to try and add value where I can. But one of the things I tell myself and some of my, my direct reports is you need to be a little bit more comfortable with ambiguity. You need to just kind of not have control over absolutely everything and let a few things play out a little bit. So maybe, maybe you know, we're heading in that direction, Maria. And, and I know that all of my developers are doing stuff that I have no idea about all the time. So, you know, yeah. kinda, and if you really like ambiguity, that. Early stage is all for you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, so listen, I, th I think, uh, you know, in that sense, we could probably tie that back a little bit uh, in terms of, um, we were talking earlier about how people grow their roles, how they how they expand, how they, how they, you know, develop their career. A lot of our audience will be, you know, next generation technology leaders. You know, they come here to listen to you guys, to expand your experience and, and how you've achieved different things and get your point of view, right? Under this heading of what's a future CIO CTO look like, just maybe a, a, a one liner from each of you on on what would you tell them to focus on? So Maria, you just gave an example of saying, you know, focus in on getting your devs to be more involved at the selection level of products. What, what, what other things? Tony, what would be your sort of one thing for an aspiring leader to, to make sure they hone a skill on in the next few years? Uh, learn how to tell a story. When you're in boards, um, when you're in... Um, you know, execs and trying to get things signed off. If you stand up and talk about the technical detail and, you know, everything that's important to the technical teams, people will switch off. So you need to tell a story about where you're going from and where you're going to in a language that the board understands. So it needs to be um, translated from technical into commercial and make it funny, make, you know, make it something people can remember. Um, but getting the key points across because they'll buy into it more because they're not just seeing a robot stood up, you know, in front of them going through, you know, a technical spec sheet. They're going through what the impact is to my business, what the impact is to my bottom line, what the ROI is and how it, most importantly, is it going to make me money or save me money? So I would say learn how to tell a story. Yeah, I like that one. Learn how to tell a story. Really good takeaway. Vicky, what about you? Um, it's another sort of huge question, but I would... I would put the role down to change is the job. Like your, your entire role revolves around change for me. The, the world is changing, tech is changing, the impact of technology changes the world's view of this role, of the work we do, the products that we produce. Technology is hugely powerful in the world um, and we have a social responsibility that goes with that 
as leaders uh, change within the organization, especially in high growth companies, you know, you, your job is to coach and, you know, sustain your team and grow your team through huge amounts of change um, in an organization as well. So I would say get comfortable with change, learn how to navigate it for you and learn how to bring other people through that change as well, because ultimately that is the job for the most yeah, part. I, I like that. I think I, I, I'm going to give my two pennies on that one. I think similarly to that, for, as a leader, associated with change but i think with your day-to-day -day, you need to be you need to be comfortable with context switching and this sort of plays to the, what we were talking about earlier about the various different roles yeah is that uh, it's not just because it's interest you but you need to turn up to every meeting with every one of your different disciplines and your business leaders and be engaged and interested and if you're not then to tony's point you know People will just think you're, a, you're, a, you know, a, an automaton, right? And so being able and comfortable with context switching so that you can turn up enthusiastic to engage with every subject in every area, I think is a good leadership trait, not just for technologists, quite frankly, but, but across the board. You yeah. can't do it all yourself. No, true, true. Um, one thing that I would like to add to Tony's uh, storytelling is uh, be prepared to back your story with data. So data science and having information black and white. So uh, in based on experience, when we have built data science and, and use data to um, inform the business, we have had the storytellers to tell the story of the of the data. But it's equally important for CIOs and CTOs to be able to utilize that data and tell the story that makes sense and back it up with uh, um, information. And I guess, I yes, guess fact data brings like... credibility to the story, right? That's that's the thing. Absolutely. It's, it, it becomes based on data rather based on your personal preference, you know? So it's, it becomes very uh, a lot more data-driven and data-centric approach. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I would also say to, really understand people's motivators. I think to Vicky's point around change management and um, you really need to, there's there's certain engineers who really just want to solve that really tricky problem, right? And like show the technical prowess and then there's people who love driving the impact. And I think that's something that's getting lost right now in the remote piece is like, people aren't always that explicit about saying, this is what gets me going. You kind of know it, but I think actually really getting deeper into understanding your team, what drives them, what's their long-term trajectory, how do you enable them is gonna, um, and, and a lot of times as a leader, in my opinion, that's like you adjusting your style, not expecting other people to adjust to you. And so how do you do that in a way to make your team as effective as possible? And I think I, th I think that's really useful. And also, I, I as a leader try to think of myself as how do I make myself obsolete by allowing those people to come up and finding which areas of my role that they want to fit into. I mean, one day, you know, we all will be obsolete to a certain extent. Right. And so I think being comfortable with that and allowing those people to progress up the chain and take a chunk out of out of something that you're doing and just just getting comfortable with that. Richard, you're looking for your next CIO, CTO. So, so as you've already pitched once to our audience, what's the what's the one skill set that you're looking for in that future leader, Richard? And everybody, sharpen your pens here, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, I, I, I sort of the comments made earlier, right? I, I think uh, sort of apply in detail, but I, I would I would just echo the point made just now around change is the only constant. I, I mean, for me, there's something around the sort of the growth mindset that, that's super important. I, all the best people I've ever worked with have, have had a massive hunger to always keep developing themselves and others. Um, and uh, yeah, for, certainly that powers me. And uh, I sort of, uh, I think if you're going to be chief technical officer, you, you, you've got to have a hunger for that sort of uh, keep, keep learning, keep, um, keep yourself learning, keep your engineers learning. Great. All right, well, listen, we're, we're going to wrap up in a second, uh, everybody. It's been, it's been really great. And thank you for the, the questions from the audience. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, uh, but just before we go, I'm just going to go around and ask each of the panelists. We, we're clearly, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. We're, we're going to be out in the world a, a little bit more. Uh, I, I personally am looking forward to being in my garden with my uh, grown-up children having a barbecue. That's that's what I'm after, right? For me, that's like, I'll feel a bit freer, I'll feel a bit more in control um, and uh, getting uh, my son back from university and my daughter and her and her partner around from around the corner where we've been waving at them through a window for the last 12 months. 
What, what are each of you looking forward to when, when we get a little bit more freer? Azita, let's start with you. Um, thanks, David. Um, so I have a, um, as I said in my profile, um, I have a puppy at home that is four months old and it demands more work than a baby. Uh, so I'm looking forward for him to become a little bit more older and uh, uh, kind of um, more settled in, here from uh, grow, moving from being puppy and more of a uh, dog basically and, and being able to share the puppy's enthusiasm with other people so that it takes that burden off of you right <laughs> absolutely yes absolutely but train him and, and make him more uh settled in the home richard what about you uh playing tennis again um haven't played that since uh, i bought a new racket it came literally the day this this new lockdown started which was pretty pretty gutting um and and honestly just having a drink after work with with colleagues I and mean, I, I started this job last august and 90% of the company I've never met face to face. Uh, I have met, I've met once or twice, so I would just love to have a drink with people after work. <laughs> Maria, Maria, what about what about you? God, so many things. I'm really dying to get on a plane. I just feel like I need to be on planes and it's been a long time um, somewhere. And I also can't wait to take meetings in coffee shops, work on myself in coffee shops, take meetings in coffee shops, wherever, but like be able to work somewhere else from my, than my home. Excellent. Tony. Uh, traveling definitely want to get back on the plane, you know, as Maria said, but you know, the ability to meet someone and actually shake the hand and not go through this awkward thing about, I don't know what to do, you know, whether I just tucked your elbow or, or whatever, but just be able to meet someone and, you know, shake the hand. Excellent. And, and Vicky, lastly, what about you? Um, on a personal level, it's definitely spending time with family, being able to go back up and uh, spend some time back up home in Yorkshire. I haven't been able to do that throughout the lockdowns. Um, on a, on a professional level, I miss whiteboards. Oh my word, sticky notes, whiteboards, tables, people, walls. I, I, the tools are amazing. Like hats off to the people that have you know, done very well through all this, creating uh, the digital tooling for this, but I cannot wait to grab my team in a room and litter the place with post-its and diagrams and ideate in person. Yeah. I, I resonate with that for, for for sure. That that and beer with the team, I think, is just something something that we're all we're all looking forward to. Listen, I, that that's the end of our questions. Thank you to all the all the panelists, and thanks thanks to the audience. Jack, let's let's uh, hand back to you and, and hear what it is that you're looking forward to doing at the end of uh, lockdown. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I suppose key for me is is spending a bit more time with the family uh, without kind of having to sit in gardens or, or like you say, wave through windows uh, and play rugby again. Uh, I've put on far too much weight during this lockdown. So yeah, start playing rugby um, again. But but yeah, listen, big thank you to all of our speakers, uh, attendees and, and everyone who asked questions. Um, I suppose another thing for us all to look forward to uh, is hopefully London Tech leaders will be able to return back to physical events soon. So we've got, um, we're starting planning a summer uh, event for the back end of summer uh, where we've got a rooftop uh, bar planned, where we're going to have uh, some influential speakers, some live music, uh, a bit from, from some of our charity partners. So please do keep your eyes peeled uh, for that. Um, we will probably do one more virtual event uh, so details will, will come out for that uh, soon. And I suppose lastly, we have got a big partnership that we'll be releasing soon as well, which hopefully can elevate London Tech Leaders platform. So yeah, lots of stuff to look forward to. So, but appreciate everyone for joining us this afternoon and yeah, have a, have a great rest of the weekend.